Good morning and welcome. You may be seated. And uh, if there's any room on your pew, sort of squeeze to the middle or the outside. Leave room for folks. Uh, we got folks looking for a seat. There's room right up here. Room right up here for one or two. Up oh, there's your friend. She's waving at you. All right, there we go, there we go, terrific. I wanna direct your attention toward the screen for our morning announcements. Good morning and welcome to New Hope Community Church. We're so glad that you decided to join us today. Here at New Hope, we have a vision to compellingly communicate the all-sufficiency of Jesus Christ who meets our every need. Pastor Tim asked us last week to do something a little crazy in church, so I need you guys to try this out again and help me out. If this you is didn't do it last week. know who our church family is. So I need you to take out your cell phones. Everybody's got them, whether it's an Apple, an Android, a flip phone. I don't think anybody's got a telegraph phone anymore. Um, go ahead and take those out and open it up and uh, open your camera. Now, you may need to flip your camera around so you can look at yourself. Look for this symbol right here. That will flip your camera around. Now, you should be looking at yourself. Go ahead and uh, take a picture of yourself. Right? Pose. Get a good picture. I need a picture of just you. Maybe you and your wife, but just you. Now, on your camera, there should, you should be able to look down now and see that picture. I need you to go ahead and click on that picture. We're going to click on it right now. Now, your screen, you should see something like this. On this screen, go ahead and click that and it's going to give you an option to text, email, or do something with that picture. I would like you to text that picture to it at newhopechurch.net. Remember, it at newhopechurch.net. You can email it if you want, but you can text it just the same way. Instead of putting a phone number in where you text, you put it at newhopechurch.net and hit send. But before you do, make sure you put your name on it so we can connect that. That's going to help us as a staff as we pray for you each and every week. That's going to help us connect your face to your prayer request. That would be great. If you're one of our guests today and you just did that crazy selfie thing, we just want to say thank you. If you didn't, don't worry about it. We're just so glad that you guys are here. Uh, if you could do us a favor and fill out in front of you the connect card in front of you. Let us know a little bit of information about yourself because we want to let you know about all the exciting ministry stuff that happens here at New Hope. We're not going to knock at your door. We're not going to call you at the phone, but we are going to send you something via snail mail and possibly email uh, just about what's going on here at New Hope. We are so glad you've decided to join us today. Ladies, we have some Bible studies for you guys to get involved in. Uh, we have a sign-up sheet going around. There's one on Tuesday nights and two on Wednesday mornings. Check your bulletins for more information, and we'd love to see you there. All right, guys, now it's our turn. We got something for you. We are calling all the mighty men of New Hope to come for a conference. Here, check this video out. Can you imagine 10,000 men together? I'm going to be a part of it. I want you to be a part of it as well. May 5th at the Save Mark Center, a day of worship, prayer, and brotherhood, featuring former NFL star Miles McPherson and former Navy SEAL Jeff Ramstead. God is going to be in the house, and he's going to be bringing a great blessing. For ticket information and a chance to win a trip for two to the Holy Land, visit MightyMenMovement.org. May 5th, will you be there? It's going to be a great conference. Make sure you guys sign up. More information is in your bulletin. Use the church code Church New Hope, and you get a discount on the conference. We would love to take a big group of New Hope people there. Hey everyone, I recently got to go to Mexico, and we are super excited to show you and tell you about what we experienced. Next Sunday, the 22nd, we will have a Mexico night. Five o'clock is when the tacos start. Who wouldn't love free tacos? And 6 o'clock is when service starts. Join us for worship, testimonies, and stories about what happened in Mexico. We hope you'll join us for this exciting night. May 3rd is the National Day of Prayer. Our nation needs prayer now more than ever. So we would love you to join with us at 12 p.m. at uh, Clovis City Hall on the front lawn there as we pray together for our city and for our nation. 
And then that night at 6 p.m. at Fresno Pacific University, we're going to get together as a city and pray and worship together. We would love to see you as New Hope show up to any of those. Can't wait to see you. Hey, everybody. There's a sign-up sheet going around. We need volunteers for the Angel Tree Football Camp. This year it's local at Edison High School on May 19th, where you'll get the chance to coach, help set up, and be a part of kids' lives whose parents are incarcerated. Um, if you have any more questions, contact Teddy Miller. Sign up today. One of the best ways to get involved and be a part of the New Hope family is to serve in one of our many ministries that we have. If you go to our webpage, newhopechurch.net, click on the ministries icon. All the way on the bottom, you'll see serving opportunities. If you click on that, you will see a list that our ministry leaders have put together of the needs and the opportunities available here at New Hope. So if you're looking for a place to plug in, go again to newhopechurch.net. Click on ministries, go all the way down to service opportunities and you will see the big list. You can click on I would like to serve and that'll email directly that ministry leader and let's get you plugged in and let's get you part of the family. Summertime is quickly approaching. Parents, if you have 4th, 5th or 6th graders who are interested in going to summer camp, there will be an informational meeting April 29th after 3rd service in the Jam Center. If you have any questions, the meeting would be a great time to get them answered. Tonight, here at New Hope at 6 p.m., we have our Sunday night service. We just started a series in the book of James, and we would love for you to show up. We have kids' church. We have great coffee. We have authentic worship. We have a really relaxed environment and a powerful message. We would love to see you tonight at 6 p.m. as we dig into the book of James. Thank you so much for coming tonight. We're so glad that you've decided to join us today. If you have a prayer request and you would like us as a New Hope staff to join you in prayer, please on the comment card, fill that out. Let us know what's going on. Let us know how we can join you in prayer for God's best in that situation. We hope that today that Jesus is sufficient in your life. Thanks for coming. Here are the sign-up sheets that are coming around for Angel Tree Football Camp. It's going to be on May the 19th. It's being uh, done at Edison High School. This is a great experience for these young kids. It's a wonderful opportunity for us to engage. If you'd like more information, sign up. This doesn't mean that you're committed, but uh, Teddy Miller will follow up with you and let you know what the expectations are as a volunteer on that day. Joe Avila happens to be here. He's the one in charge of Angel Tree Camps all across the United States. How many of them are there now that you're doing? 12 this, year. 12 this year. Angel Tree Camps across the U.S. We've had some Green, uh, Green Bay guys get involved, haven't we, recently? Yeah, guys who are currently playing for Green Bay want to plug in and want to be of help to others. So, uh, and then the two women's Bible studies are also on the sheets underneath the Angel Tree Camp volunteers. So those are, uh, those are going around. Hey, if after this service you have not had breakfast yet, uh, here's what you can do. Uh, go out either one of these doors and go around to the pavilion to the east end and there inside the gazebo you will see hash browns, cheesy potatoes, pancakes, scrambled eggs, sausage, breakfast for five bucks. You can't beat the price. Hey, was it good, Mike? Terrific. Terrific. All right. Now here's the deal. Um, this is a fundraiser for our junior high kids to go to camp this summer. It's almost $600 for them to go. Uh, we're trying to reduce that well below half if we possibly can. And so uh, go have a great breakfast. Meet some people maybe you'd never meet before. Leave a big tip. If you can't eat, just go leave a tip. There's some big jars on the table out there in the back, or you can go over to the table where the tickets for the breakfast are and just leave them something. It'll all get put there. But I can tell you, personal experience, breakfast was good. I see a few people fanning. Is it warm in here? Yes? Stuffy? Stuffy? Okay, we'll slightly take it down, just a hair. Use the inside ones, not the outside ones. All right? Very good. Uh... I want you to be praying for Loma Vista Community Church, one of our sister churches here in Clovis. I've known Joe Lavanino since he was a high school pastor uh, 25 years ago. He has been the lead pastor at this church for the last uh, 20 or 21 years. They are having their groundbreaking ceremony today, all right, out at McCall and Shaw. Uh, they have been... 
23 years in a school. That's perseverance, folks. Try to imagine 23 years in a row every Sunday morning hauling the trailer to the school, unloading all of the stuff at the end of the services, putting it back in a trailer, and doing that week after week after week for 21 years. They, uh, they technically already started the project, but because of rain, they had to cancel their first groundbreaking ceremony, and so it's going to be this afternoon right after uh, the 12 o'clock hour. So just be praying for them and this new start for them. We are very, very excited. In our next service, we have a baby dedication today. It's twins, all right? And I think this is so cool. Catch the names of the, this is rodeo month, remember? Why I'm wearing the hat, all right. This is Clint Black Day, all right. Um, and so, uh, but, but listen to the names of these, of these twins that we're gonna be dedicating today. Bodie and Ruger. Is that not awesome, man? They are so cool. And uh, I should, I should have had the ladies' quilting group make camo quilts, all right, for this pair, all right? But uh, anyway, we're, we're going to be dedicating them in the next service, so that's a very special time for us. I'm going to ask our us to come forward, if they would, and wait on us as we have our tithes and offering. I do want you to remember to pray for the Pierce family. Yesterday we had the memorial service for Milt. What a wonderful celebration of his life it was as we listened to one of his sons share about his life, as we listened, watched another son who put together a wonderful video tribute about his dad. It was just a terrific celebration. Thank you for you who volunteered. You brought refreshments. You helped to serve. It makes a difference for our church family when we share in those times together. Many of you ask about an update on Dad. Uh, Dad was 50-50 uh, shot yesterday of whether he was coming today. Uh, right now the odds are about 70-30 as we wait for the last service to see if he makes it. Uh, physically, the surgeon gave him a good clean bill of health. Uh, everything is doing well from the uh, physical perspective. But he did say the challenge of 92-year-olds having uh, anesthesia twice in nine days uh, has its, its consequences. And so he has a few hours every day where he's really chipper uh, and looks like he's doing well. And then he just sort of sits, all right? And uh, so if you just continue to pray for him, his sister will be going home on Tuesday. She's been here for almost two weeks. We've enjoyed having her here. They've enjoyed each other's company. So uh, you might catch him coming into the last service. You might not. Still uns certain of that, but continue to pray for him. He doesn't mind visitors, so if you want to stop in and see him, that's certainly fine as well. All right, well, those are the updates I wanted to bring to you. Would you join with me as we pray? Father, I love you. I'm so grateful for um, the experience of life that we get to share your son, the Lord Jesus, with. As we go through days like yesterday, uh, in the morning, we celebrate a life well lived, and we celebrated that life because just a matter of days ago, you welcomed him home into heaven. And then in the evening, we got to share with one of the greatest moments of life, and that is marriage. And so, Father, life is often like that. We have ups and downs in the adventure of a week. And so um, you are the one who loves to bring stability in our lives so that really what the wise man wrote in the book of Ecclesiastes can be true for us, that the day of one's death is better than the day of one's birth. Apart from your son, the Lord Jesus, the opposite is true. But in Christ, knowing what we know about where we're going, the date of one's death is the day of eternal life in a new home that will last forever. So, Father, we thank you for the stability you bring to our lives so that our highs are not too high and our lows are not too low, but you bring a real sense of balance and perspective to us as we trust you in your word. Father, we uh, commit to you the needs of others. I have no idea how everybody walked in here today, what they were facing in their world, what circumstances have been uh, either so rewarding for them this past week or very troubling for them. I know some in our church family are walking through cancer treatment. We've got four or five of them doing that right now, Lord. And uh, from, from, from Johnny uh, to Irma to Bob, uh, we just trust their needs to you as they continue to get treatment. Some are feeling better with treatment. Some are feeling worse. You know their needs, and Lord, we, we just continue to lift them up. If there's a way you can use others of us to be of help and hope and encouragement, you, may you find us ready, available, and willing to do so. Lord, we have a few in our congregation, like Bernie, who is waiting results of tests. 
No treatment can get started. No direction can, can, can be decided about until all the information is in. And so they're, they're on hold in a waiting room. And sometimes that's a, a frustrating place to be. But Lord, you promise us a peace that passes understanding. When frustration would seem normal, you give us something that is supernatural. Your peace that says, I can wait with you in this waiting room. Father, for... Um, for whatever else may be going on, whether some folks here are facing challenges in the workplace or there's, there's family fractures, thank you that you're big enough for each and every one of them. May there be a sense of surrender today of our circumstances to you. May we live in the uh, reality of your truth, which is beyond all circumstances. May we be attentive, Father, to what you want to speak to our hearts as we hear your word in song, as your, your Bible is opened up, your truth. and. May our hearts receive what you have for us today. May we find encouragement and hope. And Father, if there's some in need of a real life change today, may this be a moment, a moment in time that they'll look back on as a, a divine appointment where they made a most important decision about their own life and a relationship with you, and it changes them forever. Thank you. For the privilege of giving and sharing, we give you great thanks. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Milo, I have told you I want that at my uh, funeral, right? All right, yeah, yeah. It's, it's come to a concert that night, all right? Uh, wow, I love that song. Uh, just before I jump in the message today, uh, there is in the foyer, it wasn't out there when you came in, I forgot to put it out, uh, but there is the... Uh, the picture rendering, uh, we had a business meeting last week, uh, reviewed and refreshed with our church family who were present. Uh, the next step in the process of building a new set of offices and a multi-use room so we can have uh, meal functions together, we can have overflow services, we can better take care of memorial services and receptions. And so uh, that rendering is out there. Do not hesitate to call, ask questions, catch one of us. We'll do our very best to answer those, and we'll tell you more about it in the, uh, in the weeks to come. Um, we're kicking off a brand new series today, and uh, it's on the subject of heaven. In fact, your bulletin has the title for the theme. This is going to be anywhere from probably six to ten weeks. Uh, we'll see sort of how it unfolds, uh, but we're looking up with what's up with heaven. Uh, I really don't know which direction heaven is. We just sort of have this tendency to point up when we talk about heaven, and we have a tendency to point down when we're talking about hell. If I lived in Australia, that might be flip-flopped, okay? I don't know. Um, I just know that out there, somewhere, is this place that God has said, I have prepared a mansion for you. I have prepared a place for you that when the world thinks death has had the final say about your life, I'm going to prove them wrong. And I've got a place for you called heaven. Now, uh, what I really hope will happen in the adventure of this study over the next several weeks is I, I trust we will answer a lot of questions that you have. But I probably ought to ask you, what are your questions? I could assume what some questions are. You actually can Google. You could do this right now if you wanted to. I'll give you permission. Uh, what are people's questions about heaven and hell? You can ask that question just like that on Google, and it will bring up a page okay, of questions that people have asked about heaven and hell. But asking Google that question is different than asking those of you who come every single week. One of the reasons for doing this series is because I've had about a half a dozen people send me either emails or texts or face-to-face -face say, Pastor, I got, I got questions about heaven. I've had a few people give me books. Pastor, what do you think about this book on the subject of heaven? And so I thought it was probably time that we address the subject. Um, so here, I'd love you to get your phones out. This is dangerous. <laughs> this is twice in one service. <laughs> I'm going to give you right now my cell phone number. Okay, many of you have it already. It's, 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 uh, some of you say, you're going to really give out your cell number? Yes, let me give it to you now, and then I'll give you an explanation. It's 559-281-0175. Okay, 75. Now, if this is the first time you're putting it in, go ahead and, and hit it like you're calling me, and then hurry up and hang up real fast. 
Okay, that way you've got the number in your system. You can then, uh, thank you, John Realhorn just did that, all right? And, <laughs> all right, I got his number in my system, see? All right, so, but do that right now because I'm going to have you do something in a minute and I don't want all these other interruptions happening. So if it's the first time to put nine number in your phone and some of you are saying you are really giving your cell phone out, um, and, and, and here's the deal. I don't think a pastor ought to have an unlisted number. He's in the wrong profession if he's got his number unlisted, okay? Uh, it's on every business card. Okay, hang up. Yeah, don't keep ringing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hit it, then hang up real fast. A lot of them are coming in, all right? Uh, let's see here. Uh, I got it on vibrate, so I'm <laughs> taking advantage of it right now. Um, so I, I'm wanting you to do that because here's what I want you to do now. And you can put my name in if you want to right now so that if you don't want to answer my call in the future, my name will show up and you can say, nope, not taking that call. <laughs> it's what I love about cell phones because if you call me and I don't want to answer, I can act, oh, I didn't get that call, all right? Uh, no, just kidding, unless it's after 10. Um, they're still coming in. Um, but here's what I want to do. What is your question about heaven? Uh, five five nine. <laughs> All right, two eight one zero one seven five. Please don't use the number carelessly. All right, enough said. Uh, so what I'd love for you to do right now is send me your questions. Okay, uh, hang up two eight eight one two. Yeah, hang up. Don't keep ringing me. All right, here we go. Um, th there's there's a better way to do this, but. I don't know how yet, and I didn't tell anybody in the office who could figure it out how to do this. So here's the deal. I'm going to read you a few of the questions from the first service, okay? And then I'll get to some of yours that are popping up, because you might like to know what some of the questions are, all right? Uh, wow, somebody from Palmdale is calling me. Should I answer that one? Palmdale. Is that heaven? Palmdale heaven? I don't, I don't know. If you have a 661 number, hang up, all right? Okay. Well, oh, that would be more like hell is what you're saying, Palmdale? All right. All right. So here's some of the questions I was asking in the 8 o'clock service. Will we have earthly looking bodies? Um, I hope mine is heavenly looking when I get there. All right. Um, and I'm not attempting to answer these questions today, but I'll put these in the mix over the next few days. Here we go. Do we sit in heaven looking down on our family? That's a very good question. That's a really good question. All right. Um, Okay, they're popping in now, so it's creating confusion for me. Here we go. Um, will we recognize our loved ones in heaven? Is heaven like on TV? White clouds, all white people, and people everywhere. No. <laughs> Let me clarify that now. All right, no. There's going to be a lot of white people I know not making it, okay? Uh, and, and the Bible says, I will give a brief answer to that question. Uh, the Bible says that there will be people from every tribe, every nation, every kindred, every tongue. Gil Hernandez tells me that the heavenly language is Spanish, all right? So all the rest of us will have to, you know, we'll, we'll automatically know Spanish, according to, to Gil. Uh, for those of you who don't know Gil, he's our missions pastor around here, and he was a missionary for 25 years in Mexico. Here's one, and I had this one asked twice. Do animals go to heaven? Okay. There's all kinds of answers for that. I like Billy Graham's answer best. Billy Graham one time answered a lady when he, who asked him that question, and he said, if that makes you happier, then yes. <laughs> um, and, and really, there's two questions there instead of just one, because what some people are asking is, will my animals be there? See, I think I could say yes, that there probably will be animals in heaven, Go back and read uh, about both Elisha and Elijah, okay? Uh, the chariot and the horsemen thereof snatched him up. Elisha was surrounded by a heavenly host with chariots and horses, okay? So uh, I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility. They were part of original creation. But what we're saying, if we ask the question, will my pet be there? I don't know the answer to that because they don't have an eternal spirit. They weren't created in the image of God like us. So I, I, I don't know that, okay? Uh, so I'm probably not going to say yes or no to that question. Um, um, and, and I don't know if your animal was saved or not. So anyway, moving, moving right along. Um, now, of course, oh, well, somebody just said, is there a place in heaven for cats? Uh, no. Uh, <laughs> 
We know none of them are saved. They all want to control the world, all right? That's, that, uh, boy, mine does. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, three times, four times our pet's going to be in heaven, all right? Um, uh, all right, here's a, here's a good one. Do we immediately go to heaven after death or that after the second coming? That's a good question. That's a good question. Um, the Bible says that we have no sorrow in heaven, so if we can see our unsaved loved ones, will we be sorrowful? Maybe we won't even know our earthly family. A lot different than we are taught. What do you think? That's a good question, all right? Um, our sins are forgiven, so what will happen on Judgment Day? That's another. You guys are asking some really good questions here. Uh, I, I had another one at 8 o'clock service. Uh, will there be golf in heaven? Okay. Uh, uh, youth pastor, Chris, said yes, all right? So... Um, uh, another question here, uh, will we go to heaven before the thousand years or after the thousand years? Um, okay, this series is going to be about heaven. It's not going to be about eschatology. How many of you did I just lose with that statement? Okay, eschatology is the theological term for a study of end times. Okay? There's basically four perspectives about how things are going to play out. Here's what, here's what all of Christendom does believe that's, that's the same. We know. One day, Jesus is coming again. Jesus came the first time through birth, and he came as a servant. The second time he comes, the scripture says he will break open the eastern skies and every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. He comes as king the next time. Okay? He came the first time so he could take care of our sin and we could find forgiveness. He comes the next time for the final redemption of both our bodies and our souls. The scripture says the eastern skies. Why do you think it says that? Which way does the sun rise? It rises from the east, okay? So that's the imagery that's there. The rising of the sun, S-U-N, is the same direction we look for the coming of the sun, S-O-N. The vast majority of cemeteries in the world, the overwhelming majorities of the cemeteries in the world are laid out in a particular way. If you look at them closely, the headstone is at the west end. The reason is you are laying down. So... Which way are you facing when your body is raised from the dead? You are looking east. And the reason for that is strictly biblical. It is because the sun is coming from the east. So, the, the, we have, so I said all that to say this. I'm not going to be looking at all the various views of how things play out at the end. There is, the, the, there, there is a dispensationalism. That means there's seven distinct periods of dispensation before Jesus comes again. There is all millennialism, all right? Um, and, and that means that uh, Jesus could come at any time. Everything has been accomplished that needs to be accomplished. And at any time, only by his grace and his patience is God waiting to send his son back for us. Then there is the premillennialists, and none of them can get along with each other. They have three different views, okay? There's a pre-trib, there is a mid-trib, there is a post-trib. You all are about to go to sleep on me already, aren't you? Those are three different perspectives of, is it going to be before the tribulation? Is it going to be in the middle of the tribulation? Is it going to be after the tribulation? All right? And that's a whole discussion for another series sometime. And, and then you have the pan-millennialists. And those are the folks who believe it all will pan out in the end somehow, some way. Okay? <laughs> And that's probably where most of us end up, even after we've studied it and we may have picked a view. Uh, I, I, I don't mind telling folks, I happen to be an all-millennialist by choice, all right? Uh, I've taught it in, in, in Bible college. It's just where I think most of my questions get answered clearly. Uh, at one time, that was the most common accepted view in current days. Premillennial has become. That's why certain movies came out like Thief in the Night and, and uh, a few others. Um, here's the deal. If it doesn't work out the way I think it is, I'm not going to be ticked off. I'm not going to be mad if I was wrong, all right, in my way, all right? Um, you know, if a post-tribulationalist uh, discovers that it's a pre-trib rapture, he's not going to hold on to the tree and say, leave me here, leave me here. He's going to be willing to go whenever God calls us. So please know I'm not answering all those questions. This really is, what about heaven? What does that look like for us? 
So today, we're going to start this new series. It's not too late. You can email me or still text me some of your questions over the next several days. And over the course of this series, we will try to address most of those questions. So what's up with heaven? It's where we're going to try to push away the curtain and catch a glimpse of what lies beyond this life. Um, somebody once said, are our lives parts in a play already scripted by God? Or could it be that all we see is all there is? Is this life merely a stage with props? Or is there life beyond this realm? The vast majority of Americans believe that there is life after death. We've seen it in popular movies through the decades. We can go all the way back to 1941. Maybe the first movie produced that was a big hit was in 1941. I was not present. Some of you back from 1941, you might remember this movie. And I have not seen this movie, though I am going to try to find it and see it. But here comes Mr. Jordan. Any of you ever see that movie? I heard somebody say, oh. All right, so none of you were born before 46. All right, good. Church is younger than I thought we were. Uh, the next one, uh, actually that was done in 1941. The next one was done in 1946. All of us have probably seen this movie at Christmas time. It's a wonderful life. It's kind of a look behind the curtain of life after death. More recently, though, in my lifetime, uh, Ghost in 1990, big hit with Swayze in it. Uh, or how about Heaven Can Wait? Been done twice, 1943, did not see that one. Uh, did see the version in 1978. That guy who was every woman's uh, pitter-patter of their hearts was the lead actor in it. What was his name? Yeah, have you seen him lately? He did not age well, ladies, all right? Be glad, be glad you didn't hook up there, all right? Because he did not age well. Man, I just saw a picture of him recently. It was scary. Um, we might ought to cut that out of the recording back there, all right? Um, even in Disney cartoons, they got into it like All Dogs Go to Heaven done in 1989. And then just recently, uh, in 04, we had Five People You Meet in Heaven. It was a pretty big hit at the the box office. And then last year, not one of my favorite movies as you heard me say last year, but it captured people's attention because it was about life after death. The Shack. Um, in 1998, maybe one of the biggest hits of all time to deal with this kind of subject was a movie Robin Williams was in, uh, What Dreams May Come. What Dreams May Come. How many of you see that one? Yeah, yeah, a lot, a lot of people really. Uh, somebody said, that, Entertainment Weekly said, that what dreams may come was like a lost verse from the Beatles song, Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. That's the dumbest name to a song ever in the history of rock and roll, I think. All right, in case you didn't know, it was about LSD. All right. Um, but sometimes people's views of heaven has been influenced by LSD. Uh, and that's not a good thing. You see, they think it's a metaphysical candy land. Um, several years ago, Time Magazine devoted its cover story to the questions of the afterlife in an article they wrote, and they published the results of a Time CNN poll. Now, this poll is about 14 years old, so I don't like to use data quite that old. So I Googled Gallup, and I Googled the Pew Research Center, and guess what? The data has not changed much in the last 20 years on this question. In fact, it's fluctuated up and a little bit down, but no more than about three or four points either direction. It hasn't been a steady downward trend. We don't believe in afterlife anymore. It has stayed pretty consistent from 78% to 83%. Just kind of up and down about people in the United States believe in the existence of heaven. 63% of Americans believe that hell exists. Okay, 63%. That's, that was big. I didn't expect that. Um, part of the, uh, what, 37% would now include the Pope, who doesn't believe that hell exists. Uh, something very interesting, 63% of Americans believe in hell. Only 1% of them believe they're going to go there. <laughs> <laughs> they believe there's one, but it's not for me, all right? It's for everybody else. Uh, and, and, and what's somewhat humorous about that uh, well, probably humorous is not the exact best term. Uh, what's peculiar about that is the Bible says, wide is the way that leads to hell and destruction. Narrow is the way, not because it's more difficult, but because fewer people choose. Far more people 
to a lack of choice, go to hell. Fewer people think through the process of Jesus in their life. I got to tell you, uh, it was the subject of heaven and hell that prompted me to invite Jesus Christ in my life. I, I wish I could tell you I was mature enough and smart enough and wise enough when I accepted Christ to say the primary reason I want to go to heaven is because of Jesus. You have to be in church for a little while to know that the primary answer to any question a pastor asks in church is always Jesus. But you see, on the third Thursday of June in 1960, after a gentleman by the name of Lynn Wood preached a message on John 3.16, I walked down an aisle and gave my life to Jesus Christ at an altar at Hume Lake Christian Camp. I'm just calling somebody back who called me. <laughs> I was five and a half years old. I remember the day like yesterday. And at the end of the service, somebody came by with a cheap microphone, and there was about 20 or 30 of us who had accepted Christ that night. I was standing right next to my cousin, older cousin. He was about 13. His name was Phil. They asked him first why he gave his life to Jesus. I don't remember his answer. I was thinking about my answer. And at five and a half, when they put a microphone in front of my mouth and said, why did you invite Christ in your life tonight? I said, I don't want to go to hell. I want to go to heaven. It may not be the best reason, but it was a good reason. I grew up in a culture where there was a lot of what was known as hellfire and brimstone in some of the sermons. And though I think I would rather have people choose to go to heaven because of the love of God, I think there's a certain number of us who probably need to have the hell scared out of us to understand the reality of hell. And so as we look about heaven, guys, I will give you a little advance notice. We can't look at the subject of heaven without taking a small look at the subject of hell. So that will be addressed a bit. In spite of all the polls, many people wonder if life after death is just wishful thinking. Are beliefs about an afterlife merely our way of dealing about anxiety over death? The philosophers, a husband and wife team by the name of Paul and Linda Badham point out, to many contemporary philosophers, life after death is not merely unlikely, it is unconceivable. Atheist philosopher Anthony Flew agrees with him when he claims that the idea of life after death is a nonsensical statement that has no meaning, much like a square circle. This idea has been creeping into our popular culture for years, as illustrated by the band Collective Souls. Any of you all remember them? You should remember Collective Soul. Yeah. They, they did a song uh, back in the mid-90s called Heaven's Already Here. Gloria Estefan, in one of her releases in the late 90s, reduces heaven to how I feel when I'm with a particular person. That's my heaven. Let, let me share with you the words of the song, Heaven's Already Here. This is great theology, guys. This is deep thinking. Wake up to a new morning. Got my babe by my side. And I won't yield to any new warnings because I got my peace of mind. Who could bring me heaven when heaven's already here? I got my babe by my side. Isn't that deep? <laughs> Second and last verse. It, it was a short song. No more living in darkness now that love lights my way. You know, that by itself wouldn't be bad. I don't need any new changes to make me love today. Got my babe by my side. So many people will give up all of this for that and think it's reasonable. The series that we start today, What's Up With Heaven, is where we seek to push away the curtain and catch a glimpse of what lies the other side. The former Swedish Secretary General of the United Nations and a winner of the Nobel Peace Prize, and in the last service, a guy in our church, uh, man, I found out he was a lot smarter than I ever thought he was. Um, and I'm going to tell you his name in just a minute. <laughs> Holy mackerel. Um, Otmar. Otmar. Otmar and Helga. All right. Mechanic. Had, a, had his own garage. All right. He's retired now. 
It tells me he ought to be pretty smart. He's already retired. Um, but he could pronounce his name. I, I, I could not. Uh, Dag Hammarskjöld. Okay? Um, but Secretary General of the UN, he, he was killed at 61 in a plane crash in Africa. Uh, been about 40 years ago. But a brilliant, brilliant guy. Listen to what he said one time. He said, it is our conception of death which decides our answers to all the questions that life puts before us. Let me read that one again. It is our conception of death which decides our answers to all the questions that life puts before us. One of the other famous quotes of Dag was this one. For all that has been, thanks. For all that will be, yes. Sounds like Apostle Paul, doesn't it? In all things, give thanks. For this is the will of God for your life. With all that's been, thank you. With all that will be, yes. The Bible says we find our yes answer where? In Jesus Christ. I think Dag is exactly right. And the Christian faith presents a very distinct concept of death and the afterlife that many people today have never been exposed or learned to think about before. I firmly believe that the reason I invited Jesus Christ in my life at five and a half years old is not because I was any smarter than anybody else. In fact, the reality is probably a lot less smarter. But the reason a five and a half year old boy knew he didn't want to go to hell and he wanted to go to heaven is because around the dinner table at his home, that was a subject of conversation. Because when guests came to visit the house, and they would talk about a good family member who had passed away. The conversation of, hey, they're in heaven. We can rejoice. Oh, I have no idea if they knew Jesus or not. And often I would hear people express, wow, you know what? I had opportunities and I never took advantage to share my faith in Christ with my cousin, with my dad, with my next door neighbor. And they died. And I don't know where they spend eternity. I heard those conversations. I grew up in a church sitting on a pew, probably playing tic-tac-toe, all right, with my aunt to keep me quiet. I don't know if you know, but I like to talk. <laughs> and, and I could talk out loud in church. Bo's doing it in the 8 o'clock service. He might be the next rolling generation of preachers, all right. Um, but I heard far more than people probably ever thought. That's why I don't mind if you bring kids to church. We have children's church. I think it's a great idea. But I tell you what, you'll be amazed at what kids learn when you think they're distracted. I used to lay out underneath the pew, all right? But I heard, and I would hear messages about heaven and hell. And so very early on, my little mind grappled with the issue, good place, bad place. You know, do I want to go clean the toilet or do I want to go to the playground? It was as simple as that for me. Do I want to go to hell? Do I want to go to heaven? But you see, that was 55 years ago. Actually, I lied. That was 57 and a half years ago. Thank you, Fawn. Don't you know women are to keep silent in church? That was just a joke, ladies. That was just, I'm just kidding, all right? It's just, just a joke. Uh. And men aren't supposed to lie either, right? Men aren't supposed to lie either, right? Yeah, dead man. Yeah. Uh, now I completely lost my train of thought. Uh. But, but because we live in a culture where for the last 57 and a half years, us pastors preach less about hell than we used to. You recall a couple of years ago, I confessed I hadn't done it enough, so I preached a few, okay? Um, actually, some of y'all got saved during that time. Maybe it's time to do it again. Uh, it's not topic of conversation around the dinner table much anymore. It's, it's not part of everyday conversations and so it's easy for people to think there's no way I could go to a place as bad as hell if it's not talked about much 
several years ago, really as a result of a book um, that was brand new when I was working at Fresno Bible House, one of the kind of the first genre of books of its kind in, in recent history was a book written by Dr. Maurice Rawlings in 1978 called Beyond Death's Door. As a result of that book, I started asking the question, what do you believe is on the other side of death? If you've ever been to a funeral that I've done, you know I've asked that question several times at the beginning of a service. And I will often say something like this, I can't make you believe anything, but since we're having this service of somebody that all of us know, and most of us, whether we want to acknowledge it or not, there's going to be a service like this for us someday. We're all going to keep that same appointment. Since we know that, shouldn't we contemplate what, what, what is our answer for what's on the other side of death? I mean, if we think there's nothing, then live like hell and don't worry about it. But if you think there is something, then, then what is it and how do I get there? I mean, we ought to have an answer for that. Maurice Rawlings was a doctor. He was not a believer. He was uh, doing heart surgery on a patient, and he lost him on the table. He died. He got on the table and revived him. And when this patient came to, came back, he was screaming, get me out of here, get me out of here. He died again. He revived him again. It's hot, it's hot, I'm burning. Get me out of here. He lost him again four times. He lost him and he brought him back every time. The experience, you know, most of the time you read about NDEs, y'all know what that is? Near-death experiences, new term, all right? Um, most of the time it's pleasant, it's a, light, it's a white light, it's a, it's a peaceful, beautiful surrounding. And, but here was one, the opposite, and this doctor said, whoa. The end result is both the doctor and the patient eventually gave their life to Christ as a result of that experience. And I think it moves us to ask that question I have had somebody in the uh, 8 o'clock service ask if there was a book I could recommend. I wasn't really going to throw it out, but I brought It's one that somebody gave to me just uh, uh, a month or so ago. Uh, it is, I really would not recommend uh, Maurice Rollins, Beyond Death's Door. Uh, it wasn't well written. I, I will recommend this book. It's called Imagine Heaven, uh, written by John Burke. And uh, John Burke was an uh, engineer, skeptic, before he became a Christian. After becoming a Christian, he eventually became a pastor. And um, he's had a 35-year investigative search on NDEs and the Bible. He has interviewed over 1,500 people for this book, from children to adults, from people of, of uh, Christian faith to people of other faiths, and their experiences that they thought were near-death experiences. And uh, he, he says, I don't doubt any of them. What sometimes we can have doubts about is the interpretation of them. What does it mean? Uh, but he looks at the common threads in all of them, and it's really very, very well done. Let me, um, let me whet your appetite with just a paragraph in the foreword. Imagine heaven. Sorry, I did this in the last service. It's the introduction. I want to read the opening paragraph, too. The doctors told us my mom had only days to live. As she lay in the hospital for two weeks on her deathbed, I read the unedited manuscript of Imagine Heaven out loud to my sister and my mom. I don't know if mom heard it from her comatose state, but by the end, my sister's comment was, I want to go with her. I felt the same. Not in a death wish, morbid kind of way, but with a Christmas morning, childlike excitement for the exhilarating life to come. And I hope this book will do the same for you. Although all of us faith death, not all of us have an expectant hope for the future beyond this life. I believe that it's because we just can't seem to imagine it. Imagine heaven will undoubtedly help you do just that. And so if you want to do some reading, I'm going to reference this probably quite often over the next few weeks as it supports what we find in the scriptures. But as he related the incident of a sister saying about their mom, I want to go with her, I flashed back eight years ago to St. Agnes Hospital at about day 39 of 41 days my mom spent at St. Agnes. And my Aunt Ladine, who many of you knew, had been battling cancer for over 18 months already, and her and mom had already had conversations before mom got sick of Aunt Ladine's arrival to heaven before mom. Because of mom's health and both and Aunt Ladine's health, Aunt Ladine had not been able to see mom at the hospital for most of the 
previous three weeks that mom had been in there. She knew it was getting close, and she told her daughters, my cousins, I've got to see June. You see, not only were they sister-in-laws, but they had been the best of friends since their teenage years. And um, my cousins wheeled my aunt in in a wheelchair, her stocking cap on her head because she'd lost all of her hair. They pushed her right up next to the, the left side of my mother's bed, and all of us sort of backed out of the room. And we left those two good friends to visit not only do I like to talk, but I can be a bit nosy. And so I stayed just behind the curtain in the entrance of the room, and I listened to those two ladies. And the last thing I remember my aunt saying to my mom was, Oh, June, I just want to crawl up in that bed and go with you. And that was not morbid. That was joy, company, assurance, an understanding that this world has done about its worst to us it can do, and where we're headed is so much better. It doesn't mean that we still shouldn't love our life in this world, but when we understand heaven a little bit, we have such greater hope for what lies ahead of us. There was a Sunday school teacher who was teaching the class about heaven. This is a group of five to eight-year-olds. After a series of lessons on that, the teacher thought, it's time to wrap this up, so let me see if they've learned anything. And so the teacher said, if I sold my house and my car and had a huge yard yard sale and gave all the money to the church, would that get me into heaven? This was a smart group. They had been paying good attention. They said, no. And the teacher said, well, well, what if every day I vacuumed the church carpets and cleaned the bathrooms and mowed the grass? Would that get me into heaven? No, it wouldn't. Well, well, what if I was kind to the poor and gave candy to children and loved my wife? Would that get me into heaven? Once more, they all in unison said, no. Next question, then how do I get to heaven, the teacher said. And a five-year-old boy shouted out from the back of the room, you got to be dead first. And a five-year-old boy was absolutely correct. (laughs) So, as I wrap up today, what does that mean? It means before we can really look at the subject of heaven, we do have to come to grips with the subject of death. And so next Sunday, we're going to take a quick look at the subject of death, perspectives and biblical truth. I want to close with two verses of Scripture, and we'll get you out of here. Paul wrote, Eye has not seen, this is in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. Eye has not seen, nor has the ear heard, nor has the mind conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed it to us by his Spirit. And then Revelation 21, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. There will not be deep sea fishing in heaven. Sorry, Dan. There might be streams, but not a deep sea. All right? Uh, I saw the holy city, the new unless it makes you happier. Then maybe he'll give you one. I saw the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband, I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them, and he will be their God. He'll wipe, listen to this, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There'll be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He is seated on the throne, and I am making everything new. And then he said, Write this down. These words are trustworthy and true. He said, I am the Alpha and the Omega. I'm the beginning and the end. And to him who is thirsty, I will give you to drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. He who overcomes will inherit all this, and I will be his God, and he will be my child. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, idolaters, and liars, all liars, their place will be in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. So, folks, over the next several weeks, we will be looking at death, heaven, and a little bit of hell. And I hope you find it really helpful. Let's pray. Father, some may think that they just experienced a little hell on earth because I went five minutes over. 
but you were a God of grace, and so we say thank you for your grace. In fact, it's your grace that gets all of us out of hell if we choose your grace and gets us into heaven. We all deserve the destiny of our own sinful nature, but by your Son, you came to wipe out, make white as snow, all of our sin so that we are worthy of a place called heaven. We don't have to be old or mature or smart or wise. We have to be simple enough as a five-year-old boy to say, I don't want to go to hell. I want to go to heaven. Jesus, come be in my life. And so if there's a man or a woman or a young person in the service today that has already come to that conclusion, thank you for hearing their prayer as they are sharing with you their needs at this very moment. Thank you. In Christ's name, amen. God bless you. Go have breakfast. If you don't have breakfast, leave them a tip, all right?